Hi, it's Pastor Jeff, and I want to welcome you back to our Gospel Planting Course for Leaders. Remember, it's in Gospel Planting that we see that the Lord has called his leaders to love and live out the Word of God, the will of God, and the ways of God. And today, we're now in session number five, where we will be defining the definitive truths and terms that establish a biblical worldview, that when we gospel plant, when planting the gospel, it's critical that we have, we establish, and we build a biblical worldview in all that we do. Let me remind you that we are focusing on gospel planting because our Lord has called commanded and commissioned his gospel people to be his gospel planters locally, regionally, and globally. This is the essence of the great commandments and the great commission being lived out together. And by way of review, we've already had an introductory session that has laid out our vision for the course. We've looked at the defining of key truths as well to understand the reality of absolute truth. We've defined our Lord, God, the God of the Bible, and last time we defined the gospel. Today we're going to move forward now and again we're going to focus on establishing a framework, an understanding, a foundation if you will, of a biblical worldview. Let me remind you again that our course, this course is going to be broken into three major parts, 10 sessions per each major part. Part number one, we are focusing on defining reality, defining reality. We will have 10 sessions on defining key realities. Then when we move into section number two, we will be looking at describing restoration. We will describe God's restoration process. And then after 10 sessions there, we'll move into the third and final part of our course where we will have 10 different sessions that key in on the deploying of reproducers. So we define reality, we describe restoration, and then we deploy reproducers. So today, we're now in session number five, and we're going to focus in on defining terms and truths that establish a biblical worldview. Now, let me just tell you that the big idea here is to understand that healthy biblical gospel planting requires a commitment, a commitment to learning, loving, and living out God's word God's will and God's way. It's another way of saying that there is a biblical commitment to a biblical worldview in and all, all healthy, true, biblical gospel planting. So for our time, I'm again speaking to you as leaders. And so please understand our goal here is to help you to be a helper. And so in establishing the understanding that true healthy gospel planting will require and embrace and exemplify a commitment to learning, loving, and living out God's will, we're going to focus in on these three pillars. That the head needs to learn God's truth. The heart needs to love with God's love. And the hands need to live out the actual embrace and doing of all that God has given for his people. That if we're going to define gospel planting at this stage, we now need to establish this worldview. So for this session and this course, I'm going to give you in the time that we have left three primary sections to focus on. That which we need to learn, that which describes and helps to define how we love, and that which gives a good biblical blueprint 
for how one is to live, how the Christian, how the church is to live. So in gospel planting, in the making of disciples, we establish from God's word what truly is God's will and God's ways for accomplishing his will per his word. So what I'd like to do is establish with you, just by example, a number of scripture references that help us to frame in that which we are to learn, that will help us paint the portrait of how we love, and that which again lays out a blueprint for how we are to live. If you are going to gospel plant and establish the building of disciples that the Lord will build into his church, we must have this three-legged stool of learning rightly, loving and living righteously, all by God's grace and all for his glory. So let's first begin by looking at that which will frame in what needs to be learned. And again, I'm going to give you scripture references, and in the notes, you'll have all of the scripture itself attached, so I encourage you to go there and see the word. But for you as leaders, I'm simply going to establish the framework. And know this, when you go and gospel plant, when you go and make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples, I strongly encourage you to use these notes. And with your disciples, don't do as I'm doing here and quickly reference as though they were leaders. No, take your disciple, take the lost and walk them through this understanding. Take the lover, the new baby Christian, and walk them through this understanding. For the lost, God may use his word to capture them and draw them in. For the new lover or the growing learner and even the leader, you can use this outline of scripture to help them to grow and to be sanctified. For our time, let me just simply begin here with that which we need to learn. And I would say to you that we should begin with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 to see that all of Christianity is to submit to the authority of God's word. If you look at Hebrews 4, 12, we're reminded here that God's word, the Bible, it's far more than a book. This is the living and active, powerful word of our God. People need to learn the authority and the power and the purposes and the promises that are God's word. In Isaiah 66, 2, we see that Christians are to tremble at God's word. Again, to know that our God and his word are both awesome and awe-inspiring to the point of causing the believer to tremble. We must establish, people need to learn the reverence that is called for in God's word from the God of the word. People need to learn from Genesis 1, 1 and John 1 that Jesus is not only Christ, but creator. We see the biblical account of all that is creation and we see that Jesus is also creator God. It establishes both a biblical worldview for all that is around us and a biblical worldview for Christ's role in creation. This too will be built upon in other things that we learn and we do. We can look to John 14, 6 to establish the need to learn a biblical Christology, to see that salvation is found in no one and nothing else. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That must be learned if we're going to plant the gospel effectively. In the same way, when we go to Matthew 3, 16 and 17, we can see and establish the teaching, the learning of the biblical trinity. Here we see at Jesus' baptism, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all independently interacting. It helps to establish and can be used to teach the truth of the trinity. Again, go to Genesis 3 and John 3. And in the same way that we parallel Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1, we parallel Genesis 3 and John 3 to establish that sin came into the world 
and a promised Savior, Jesus the Christ, was established all in Genesis 3. When we go to John 3, we see that it is the Savior, Jesus the Christ, who says, you must be born again. And when we look at John 3.3, 3, John 3.16, and then John 3.36, we see it all come together. In fact, in John 3.36, we're told that those who believe this truth that is Christ have life. But those who do not obey do not have life, but instead the wrath of God remains or abides on them. Here we see the biblical teaching that believing is obeying. If we're not obeying the Lord and the gospel's truth, we're not believing the Lord and the gospel's truths. Those aren't my words. That's the word of God. You see why it's so important that we learn not only the things of the word, but the full truth and the authority of the word. We go on and in Matthew 5, 17, we see that there is no cheap grace, that Jesus did not come to lower the standards. He fulfilled the law and raised the standards. Amen. It's in John 6, where we see that people need to learn that the only hope of salvation comes through the miracle, the miraculous grace where, as Jesus said, no one, no dead soul gets up and comes to me. No one comes to me unless the Father draws them. It takes the miraculous grace of God for anyone to become a Christian. This has to be learned. Otherwise, people are going to think that they can become a Christian if and when they choose to become a Christian. There's no grace. There's no miracle. It's all a matter of personal decision. Oh, the necessity, the essence of desperate need for the world to learn this truth, these truths of the gospel. I encourage you to learn what we call the Roman road. Go through Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 6.23, Romans 8.1, Romans 10.9, Romans 12.1 and following. See how the Bible lays out the path of salvation so clearly, so powerfully, so beautifully. We need people to learn that our God has been sovereignly in control over them personally from before the time that they were born. Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5 show people this, that they were known and called, and if they're a believer, commissioned even before they were born. This also teaches how the Christian is to respond, what we need to learn about abortion and the true value of life. Amen. Go to Romans 10, 17 to see and help people to realize that faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of God. No one becomes a Christian because they were attracted into a popular church. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Romans 1, 16, 17, and 18 will tell you that we cannot be ashamed of the gospel and heaven and hell are at stake. I pray that we learn these truths. We learn in Matthew 25, 46, people need to know that there are only two destinations. You will ultimately end up in either heaven or hell. There are no multiple options. There's no deep sleep. There's no do-overs. People need to learn, per John 8, 31 through 36, that it is these truths, the truth that is Jesus and his word that will set people free. It is the truth that sets people free, and those who have been freed are free indeed. Amen. Understand the role of God's truth. If you go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, you'll find what is for me my favorite way to share and show and describe and explain the gospel. We see that the gospel truth is that those who have been saved have been saved by grace through faith, not of works, so that no one will boast. You see, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, per the word of God alone, for the glory of God alone. This must be learned, otherwise all of life will be skewed. And even church life, even the understandings of what it is to be a Christian can be perverted. Perverted even to the point of being false false converts, false conversions. Too many people who have not learned the truth 
have been walking around, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, thinking that they're on their way to heaven, only one day to hear him say, get away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. Not for a lack of confidence, not for a lack of sincerity, not even for a lack of what appeared to be works done through them. No, they never learned or loved this truth that is Jesus, the biblical gospel. That's why these things are so important to establish when you plant the gospel. I pray that you'll embrace Proverbs 12, 21, which is in concert with other parts of the scripture that assure us that if you've been saved, you've been saved forever. That those that God adopts, when God the Father adopts you, he brings no one back to the orphanage. You have this assurance. We need to teach. People need to learn their eternal security in Christ. Not before Christ, not in church, but in Christ to know that you will never lose your salvation because of the power and the promises, the purity of our God. Amen. We need to teach about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, that those that have been filled with the Spirit will have the Spirit coming out through them, that there will be a love, joy, peace, patience, the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. People need to learn this so that they not only expect it, but that they embrace it, that they can grow into their fullness. This is what people need to learn. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, I said to you earlier that Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is my favorite definition of the gospel. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 is my favorite description of the, the gospel being lived out. You see, here we're told that if you have been saved, and you need to learn this, if you've been saved, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You're a minister of reconciliation. You're an ambassador for Christ. Your sin has been replaced with the very righteousness of God. For he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Learn, love, live this relationship that the Lord has promised to his children and then plant this understanding. Make sure people learn this truth. When you go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, you see what I believe is probably the most simple explanation of the gospel. When you go to Ephesians 4, verse 14, 15, and 16, you see the role and the necessity for truth and love in this fallen world. People need to learn not only how to share truth and love, but why we share truth and love. And that when we see people being blown around by the winds of the deceiving teaching, when people are upside down with their fears and their disillusionments, it's the truth in love that is the answer every single time. People need to learn this. Amen. In Galatians 1, 6 through 9, people need to learn. When we plant the gospel, we need people to understand that if anyone brings any other gospel, as Paul tells the, the Galatians in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, anyone comes with a different gospel than these truths, these terms, these defining realities per God's word, any other profession, any other teaching, such teachers are to be damned. He says it twice. In fact, in verse 9, he says, let me say again in case you've missed what I said the first time. If anyone brings any other truths than these gospel truths, they are to be damned. I wonder if you've learned this leader. And are you ready, willing, and able to teach others the same? If you go to Romans 8.37, people need to learn when we plant the gospel that in Christ they become overwhelming overcomers. Amen. We need people to know that it is the resurrection of Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 15.17, that tells us that the proof of all that is Christianity was offered and stands in the resurrection of Christ. I love 40, uh, Psalm 46.10 that reminds us that our Lord is large and in charge all the time. We see the sovereign promise and power of our Lord. Be still and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. I pray you see here, it's just a framework of what needs to be learned to establish the truth of a biblical worldview. With that, let's move on now to the second major part, and that is the love. That when we see what needs to be learned, it leads now to a better understanding, embrace, and living out of how the Christian is to love. To plant the gospel is to plant the love of God. To be a planter of the gospel is to be a planter of the love of God. And again, let's go to God's word to get God's will and have his ways explained. I begin with 1 John 3.16. Here we see this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. Love lives out this love. Amen. 1 John 3.18. For let us not love with word and tongue, but in action and in truth. Biblical love, Christ-like love, is the real deal. We know this when we go to John 3.16, the most famous verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Love sacrifices. Love gives. Love authenticates. When you look at Mark 12, 30 and 31, we see what we know of as the great commandments. You are to love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, biblical love is the authenticator. It is the standard. It's the blueprint. Where there is no love, everything else, no matter what you say, is going to be like a resounding gong, just clanging cymbals. Matthew 25, 40 gives us that Christ-like love in terms of a perspective. The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did these acts of kindness to one of these brothers or sisters, these least of these, you did it for me. You see... Jesus said that if you love in action, you are demonstrating your love for him. And when you don't love in action, you're demonstrating a lack of love for him. Love. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Love obeys. Disobedience is a lack of love. Not my words. This comes from our king. 1 Corinthians 13 Go from verses 4 to 8 and you'll see a beautiful description of love. I love how verse 8 says at the very beginning, love never fails. Amen. So love is not just flowery. Love perseveres. Love has power. Love is the expression of the gospel being lived out. In John 17, 20 and 21, that entire chapter is Jesus praying, God the Son praying to God the Father. And we see a love that is displayed in unity, that the Trinitarian unity, which is the highest love that could ever be, is to be exemplified within the family of God, that we, the church, true Christians, were to love one another. Jesus said, as the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, so are we to be in him and be in a perfect unity, a true supernatural love for one another, which Jesus says here in John 17, will show the world that he is Lord. He said, may we love this way so that the world will know that the Father sent Jesus as Lord. Amen. Go to Psalm 23 and you'll see the love of the great shepherd. See how love cares for, literally does all that is needed as best can be done. We're to exemplify this way of the great shepherd in our love. 1 Corinthians 9, 22, to the weak I became weak. Paul says, love will adapt. Love will be fluid and flexible for the purpose of sharing the gospel, bringing God glory, and demonstrating God's love through God's people to a world that desperately needs both. Amen.
one more for love. And again, these are just samples. You get the idea that as a gospel planter, you need to establish an understanding of the framework, the fence, if you will, around the family of God so that there is a right understanding of what needs to be learned that there is a righteous understanding of how the church is to truly be Christ-like in our love. The last verse here is Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You see, true biblical Christ-like love forgives unconditionally. It's not a love that forgives so long as... It's a love that forgives no matter what. We are to love as we have been loved. And therefore, we will forgive in the way that we have been forgiven. Amen. All right, one more part here. Let's move on now to the living out. If we've learned about God's word, God's will, and God's way, we've seen now that we are to love per God's word, God's will, and God's way. Let's look now at the third and final part for this session, how we are to live out God's word, God's will, and God's ways. And again, we're simply establishing a framework. So where and when we plant the gospel, be it in one disciple or in a region that is going to become a number of different disciples that God grows into his church, we learn, we love, and we live. Our head our heart and our hands embrace and exemplify the gospel. Well, when it comes to living or being the church, living out this truth in love, being the church, I always point to Acts 1-8 for the very beginning. Our church was built on this verse, the last words of Christ before he ascends to heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jer Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses locally, regionally, and globally. So the church lives out God's truth and love by being his witnesses. We're being his witnesses all over the world through his power and his promise and for his purpose. Amen. We also live this out being sanctified. We live out a perpetual work in progress, living and loving for Christ. It's John 17, 17 that says the word of God, his truth will be what sanctifies us. That's how we live. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says that we will be those who will abide in him. We will continue to pray without ceasing. We abide in prayer, we depend on, we come to him over and over and over again. 1 John 2, 6 says we won't just come to him in prayer, but that we'll walk as Jesus walked. We must, we must be his witness and walk as he walked. There's no time out. There's no season when. There's no vacation from being Christ-like. In Matthew 10, 16, a verse I've asked my son to take as a life verse. We are to live out being the church by being shrewd as serpents and as innocent as dove. People need to learn how to live and to love like Christ. In Romans 12, 12, we see that there's a calibrating that comes in our joyful hope and in our patient perseverance through affliction. We are told, Jesus said, that you and I should expect to be persecuted. There is no way around this. And so if we live understanding what to expect, we're much more apt to live righteously knowing what's coming. Again, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we're to not trust our own understanding or that of the world. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Not easy, not downhill, but straight. And we may walk straight through the thick of things down here. May it be for the glory of God and may we be those witnesses, those ambassadors, those ministers of reconciliation that bring him glory by championing his grace and his gospel. Amen. We live out a love for one another. John 13, 35. John 13, 35, Jesus said that we will be known 
by our love for one another. John 7, 24, we are going to be known as those who discern and judge righteously. If you've ever heard somebody say, hey, judge not lest you be judged. Hey, don't be so judgmental. Christians aren't supposed to judge. Well, those are misrepresentations of God's word. While the word does say, judge not lest you be judged, what he's telling us is don't judge superficially or else you will be judged wrongly as well. But instead, here in John 7, 24, most people are shocked to learn this. People need to learn and live this out. Jesus commands the Christian to judge. He commands the Christian to judge. Otherwise, you could never have discernment. You could never display wisdom. You could never make a good or righteous choice. You see, the command to judge in John 7, 24, you live out judging righteously, judging per the word, the will, and the ways of God. And then you let the chips fall where they may. Amen. Go to Philippians 4, 12, and you see that we are to live with a contentedness. You go to the next verse, and you see that we're able to live out knowing that we can do all things in Christ who gives us strength. Let us never be intimidated to follow the path of obedience. Let us always be content with the fruit of that faithful obedience. Amen. In Galatians 2.20, we see that the Christian is to live crucified with Christ, that we no longer live in our own power for our own purposes, with our own priorities. No, to live the life of a gospel planter, to live in the field where the gospel has been planted, is to live as one who has been crucified with Christ. We see this specifically in Luke 9.23, where Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. If you're not willing to pick up your cross daily, to become crucified daily, and follow me, to literally faithfully follow Christ, you cannot be my disciple. Those are the words of Jesus. People need to understand that. When we're not living out a faithfully following, cross-carrying life, we are not following him, and we are not, at that point, his disciple. Oh, I pray that you're seeing how the learning, the loving, and the living unify together in the heart. And the proof, the proof you'll see before we finish, of the Christian life. Now, Ephesians 6, 10 and following, we're to live in the full armor of God. People need to understand that you live in the full armor of God. You don't go get it in case of an emergency. You don't know how to describe it. You don't point at it. You live in the full armor of God. That's the teaching. Why? Because you're in a full-time war. Spiritual warfare is all around you all the time. You're in the middle of it, Christian, every day of your life. We are to live perpetually in the full armor of God. Now, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says that you and I, Christian, we live in part by testing ourselves to examine whether or not, for example, am I in the full armor of God? Am I in the family of God? Am I in the sweet spot of my relationship? Or am I drifting? Or am I stumbling? To test ourselves, to live out the faith is to test oneself per the word, the will, and the way of God. Now, 2 Peter 1.3, related very closely to Philippians 4.13, this is an incredible assurance to remind you and me in the same way that we see in Romans uh, 8.37, that we have received everything we need for life and godliness. There are no excuses to be lived out in the Christian life. 2 Peter 1.3, you have received everything you need for life and godliness. Again, ties into Philippians 4.13, you can do all things in Christ who gives you strength. If he's called you to it, he's equipped you for it. Now, you can't do everything you want to do, but you can do everything that God wants you to do. That's the promise. Colossians 3.23 says that how you live is going to reflect your faith by showing whether or not you're giving God your very best in all that you do. Colossians 3.23 says that the Christian is to live their life giving God the very best in all that they do. Giving your best to God is not a Sunday thing. It's not a church visitation thing. It's a witnessing thing. It's a fulfillment. It's an overcoming reality. Amen.
In Acts 20, 24, God's word says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The Christian life is in part a race, and we are to be focused on it in a way that gives God glory and demonstrates our dedication to him. Now, this is seen again in another way when you read Ezekiel chapter 33. Go through verses 1 through 11, and you'll see that to live out the Christian life is to live as a watchman on the wall. That once you've been saved, you've been saved to serve, and to serve in part as a soldier, in part as a missionary. And we're told that if we shirk from these responsibilities, and again, I would encourage you to go and read Hebrews 10, if we shrink back, if we don't serve as the watchman on the wall, God says that he's going to hold us accountable. The blood that will be on the hands of the witness who didn't witness, the soldier who didn't sound the alarm, the watchman on the wall that didn't watch, it's going to be devastating. Amen. Well, if you go to Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you'll see a similar call, but in a different context. Here we live out per Jesus. This is him in the Sermon on the Mount as the salt of the world, that the life of the Christian and the Christian church is to flavor and help to preserve the world around us. We're the salt. We're also the light. We're the light and the love of Christ that brings his love and light into the dark and dying world that desperately needs both the Lord's love and his light. This is how we live. This is how we be. Amen. If you go to Matthew 28, 18 through 20, this is what is perhaps the most famous call on how we are to live. It is the Great Commission. Jesus says that all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to him. Therefore, we are to go and make disciples. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Get this, teaching them, teaching them to obey, to obey every command that Jesus has given. And he says, if that's a little daunting, don't worry. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. This is how we live, making disciples. In Titus 1, verses 10 through 16, what you'll find is that this is at times going to be very hard. It's going to be confrontational. It may even be combatively confrontational. The key is, even when you're in a combative confrontation, it's that the Christian remains compassionate in the confrontation. Unwavering, worship-filled, and ready for warfare. That's Titus 1, 10 through 16. That's the life of the Christian. Now, Hebrews 13, 17 says that when you have God-honoring Christian leadership, you're to honor and submit to that Christian leadership. So on one hand, you may have to confront the false teachers, the deceivers, the wolves who are false teaching leaders. On the other hand, when you have good leadership, you're called to submit to that leadership as unto the Lord, that the leaders will have joy in feeding and leading you as sheep. Amen. Jeremiah 7, 17, 7 and 8 reminds us that we live with the faith even in the midst of drought and dire despair. When the world is upside down and nobody sees any way out, we are to live with a peace and a confidence, a witness that inspires because we have a faith in the Lord who controls all things. We know that our God is sovereign. He is living. He's alive. He's good. He's gracious. He's working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, Romans 8, 28. And that per Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, becomes our witness to the world. Amen. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 says that when we are living that witness, we will be the aroma of Christ, that into the very nostrils of the world will come the aroma of Christ when we are living out this love affair with Christ. And he warns us that to some, we're going to smell like death. They're going to run from us because we smell like death to them. Rest assured, friends, that if you are truly the aroma of Christ, they're not running from you, they're running from Christ. And in the same way, 
when we are the aroma of Christ, others will be drawn to him through our aroma. And it's not us that they are literally drawn to, it's him. That when we are the aroma of Christ, we will be the aroma of life to some, and they will come to him. Let us not steal God's glory and misunderstand this. Amen. I'd send you to Daniel 3 to read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to see the courage and the boldness of faith no matter what. And not just because you trust that God will save you in the here and now, but because you know God will save you for eternity. That you'll be able to say like those three young boys to King Nebuchadnezzar, I know, we know, our God is able Even if he doesn't show up and save us in the here and now, we know who he is and will be with him for forever, so we will not bow our knee to you or anything or anyone else in the world. May we live with this kind of courage and boldness. I pray that we'll live as fishers of men and that we'll go looking for the persons of peace, like Jesus describes in Luke 10 and what he describes again in Matthew 4, 19, that this is how we live. We live as fishers for men, looking for persons of peace. We're not looking for crowds. We're looking for those that Christ is drawing, those who will become his children. We do this per 2 Timothy 2. We do it in a way that multiplies the mission. We find disciples who will make disciples, who will make disciples, who will make disciples. 2 Timothy 2.2 shows us living in this four-generation missional cycle. Paul disciples Timothy, tells Timothy to find those worthy men that he can disciple, generation three, who in turn will then disciple others, generation four. This is how we live out as the Christian family. We do it per Hebrews 12, 1, recognizing that at times we don't just lay down the sin, we lay down the encumbrances that slow us down. Anything that slows down your pursuit of the glory of God, anything that slows down the Christian's race in running for Christ, anything, and it could be, quote, good things that get in the way of God's things, we lay it down. We don't just put down the sin, which is obviously wrong. We put down those things that slow us down, that hinder our worship. Hebrews 12, 1 and following. Remember, it's Revelation 21, 8 that tells us that there'll be no cowards in heaven. Consequently, we live courageously and we confront cowardice, be it in ourselves as fear comes in or in others who need to be inspired by this truth. Revelation 3.16 says that the Laodicean church, if it remains lukewarm, as puffed up and self-righteous as they are, as much confidence and perhaps even sincerity that they may have, that if they continue to live lukewarm, Jesus says he will spit them out of his mouth. They will be damned forever. May we realize that the true church never lives lukewarm. That is not the posture. It is not what love looks like being lived out. We will be those who burn with a passion for Christ, passion for Christ and his gospel mission. Amen. Go to Joshua 24, 15, and you can see this on, in terms of a family. As Joshua says, as for me in my home, we will serve and follow the Lord. That's how we live be it as an individual Christian, as a corporate church, or as a Christian family. We're devoted to following the Lord. See too in 1 Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things as for you do this, this will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. We live guarding our witness, guarding the word of God. We, as Jude says, we contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This is how we live, guarding our ears from what we hear. Don't listen to the lies. We guard the doctrine. Make sure it's not just superficial, but that it's the supernatural truth of God's word, per the word of God. If you go to Isaiah 40, 31, it says that we'll be waiting as though we're on the wings of eagles. Know that it is the Lord himself who will sustain and carry you home. Live with him, for him, and by him, and he will take you home. Amen.
and amen. Know this, that if you choose to derail, to go off course, be like Demas, who unfortunately gets caught up in the ways of the world, come to realize that if there is no holiness, there will be no heaven for you. That's Hebrews 12, 14. It doesn't matter how well you started. It's going to matter how well you finished. Was the righteousness of God actually in you? Again, per 2 Corinthians 5, 21, this is the gospel. Hebrews 12, 14 says that if that's not true and you leave the road of holiness, it doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It's evidence of the fact, again, per Demas that, or Judas, it's that you never had that. Remember, Judas didn't lose his salvation at the end. We we're told in John 6, Jesus said early in the ministry, he said, one of you is a devil. You see, friends, there are many people who don't realize, haven't learned, don't really love that living in Christ is something that will last. And if it doesn't, then it's like the parable of the soils. You may have had an experience, but you didn't receive the miracle of transformation. The old never became new. The old just had a fresh start. It got refreshed. It got repackaged. It put different clothes on. But it's like putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. This is what is needed. We need to understand this. And again, I bring you now back to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It's the only passage I've repeated in all of this lesson because testing ourselves is not a one and done deal. We're to test ourselves ongoingly. This is how we live out this life where we're demonstrating repentance over time, which means that we need to be testing ourselves over time. Oh, if Judas would have tested himself and cried out to Christ. If Demas would have tested himself before he got choked out and, and caught back up in the ways of the world, he might have repented and returned. So again, test yourselves in an ongoing way. This is how the church lives. And 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive in this process. Christians live by taking every thought captive. John 15, 8, here we see that your life, as I've said before earlier on, you're living out this love that you've learned. It will be proven by your fruit. That's what Jesus said. John 15, 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. Now, as if that weren't enough, here's where the real power comes in. He just declared that by bearing much fruit, the Christian brings God the Father glory. This is how Jesus closes that verse. And by bearing much fruit, so you prove to be my disciple. You prove your faith in Christ by your much fruit. You prove your faith by your much proof. People need to learn this love this and live this. And if they don't, let God's word tell them who they are, where they are, what condition they are in. This is how we learn, we love, and we live. I send you, in closing, to two last passages. One is 2 Timothy, again, 2, verses 1 through 6, and you see that living the life of the believer is the call to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, all out of a heart of God's love given to you, his grace, and for his glory by championing this gospel. And you're to do it like a soldier who is so devoted, so intensely committed to the mission of life and death, that you do not get involved with civilian affairs. You don't drift. You don't get disconnected. You don't get distracted, drawn away by other things. In fact, you're to do it like an Olympic athlete who understands these guardrails from God's word, and you follow the guidance of God's spirit within these guardrails. You, you must run your race according to the rules of God. And then you do it also like a farmer who is out months ahead of time working in the field, clearing stones, preparing the ground, plowing, sowing seeds, watering, weeding, eventually harvesting. You have the work ethic of the farmer. So devoted is the life of the Christian. And in closing, if you'll go to Acts 
chapter 2, verses 42 through 46, you'll see what is arguably the most beautiful family portrait of Christ's people living out their life in Christ as the church. And you'll see how we live, what we do, and, and that we're supernaturally unified with a singular, riotous passion and purpose to bring God glory as the family of God on the mission of God. Again, all for his glory, all by his grace, and always and only gospel-centered and Christ-driven. I pray that this session has helped you. And again, to see that our purpose here is to put a fence around the family of God, to help people to understand what must, must be learned as truth in the head, what must be lived out as the love of God in our hearts, and how we live out that learning and that loving with the hands and the feet, the lips and the very fingertips of God as the family. I pray that this has helped to equip you as a gospel planter. And again, I encourage you to walk through this session and these notes with those that you will disciple as the gospel planter. Walk through them and take your time. I've spent literally months and months walking through what we've done here in this last session with people who I have seen the fruit later come from to the glory of God. Again, go be the gospel planter God has called you to be. Give him glory, celebrate his grace, and make much of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen.